I am live. Hello. I'm going to double check on Discord and over on YouTube chat. I see no typing. Am I there yet? Yeah, it seems to be live. Hello. Working now. All right, success again. Uh, let me head over here to the workbench. And let's go full screen. So um, actually, I'll do a little picture in picture. Yes, no, are you seeing that? Uh, oh yeah, you get that in the lower, lower corner there. There we go, sorry for all the switching. And yes, there's definitely a minute delay that I need to get used to. Transcribed the audio to Discord, ooh, crazy. Do you hear hum? Mm, that's just me humming, sorry. Yeah, I've got air conditioning on so you might hear that. Uh, hopefully it's nothing weirder than that or louder than that. Uh, okay, so We'll see uh, anyone who's watching this that's over in the YouTube. Um, hey, Jeff, you were on the show and tell yesterday. Nice to see you again. Uh, did you make the fidget spinner? Is that you, Jeff? There were two Jeffs. Um, yeah, so here I am in two chats. So we'll see if that works. Did you guys know that the, uh, sp the split screen on these iPads? This will be a little inception moment, but this iPad, you can actually have two apps. So one of these is Discord, and one of these is uh, just Safari showing the chat there. So, yeah. Yanni Turinen says, nice linear stuff. So let's talk about that. A um, couple things I wanted to talk about today, actually. So let's get a couple little talking about things out of the way first, and then we'll dive into this. So uh, first thing is, let me swap over to full screen here. I just got these cool little uh, Neo digits in. These are from Max Surgre, I think is the pronunciation of your name. I'm sorry if I screwed that up, Max. And there was a crowd, crowdfunding, crowdsource, crowd supply, crowd supply, I think, campaign for these. Uh, there's a URL on here that I don't think there was much at the other end of, uh, neosegment.com. But these are little 3D printed cases over some nice diffusers with little tiny NeoPixels on them. I haven't even gotten a chance to try them out, but they look really cool. They've got little edge connectors so you can daisy chain multiple segments. I don't know what the limitation is for it. Uh, Ooh, look at that. He's even got Neo Segment printed into the side of it there. It's pretty cool. Um, ooh, it looks like my Discord is not updating. Maybe it doesn't like being split screened or people aren't saying anything. I'll just type hi in there and see if that refreshes it. Um, his from AC, okay. So, yeah, this is pretty cool. There's a library uh, for Arduino and Particle I.O as well as, I believe, a Raspberry Pi library that's being worked on. It's uh, typical NeoPixel style um, connections that you'll make to ground, five volts, and a data line. And I'm excited to try these out. Max was showing me some uh, work he was doing on these right around the time I was building my big giant uh, Ninja timer display. And he said, hey, check it out. I'm working on these little uh, digits, little compared to those, but really big compared to your usual little um, matrix LED uh, display, and they're RGB. So these are pretty cool. I'm looking, looking for, yeah, they're really thin. In fact, I haven't even tried these yet, but I got to open it up and have a look and see if there's anything interesting to look at. So let's take a look. I think you can focus on that. I can't focus on that without some glasses on. These are tiny. Let me grab some uh, reading glasses. This is what happens when you get old, kids. Don't get old. All right, so two screws on the back. Um, 
Are they glued shut or held together? Yeah, little tiny screws, not even all that tiny. Looks like little two millimeter or M2 screws probably. It looks like a nicely 3D printed, probably like a sintered nylon type of, or is that layers? No, it just looks like layers, I guess an FDM printer. Yeah, you can see the little zigzags in the top. And what do we have inside? We have another layer of uh, spacing. This is the critical thing I found when I was doing the, the Ninja Timer. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have found this too, is diffuser needs space. So light source and then a bunch of space and then the diffuser. So it looks like Max came up with a nice little seven segment blocking design there. And then he's got a couple of uh, looks like two or more pieces of, yeah, two pieces of some diffusion plastic. It's a little thicker than vellum. Uh, all right. And I'm sorry, I'm not even going to attempt to, I didn't get the library installed, so I'm not going to attempt to go futz with that and power these on today, but maybe next week. How about, there's the nice little 3D printed diffuser, and there is the board. This is really cool. Nicely done, man. And those look like standard NeoPixels to me. Or WRT, whatever, 18, 12 Overture. I forget the real name now. Um, sometimes, yeah. That's cool. All right. So check those out. They're called Neo Segments. And uh, sorry for taking it apart, Max. But not sorry, because we all want to see what's inside of everything. Uh, cool. So that's those guys. And... Um, one other thing, I, I talked about this on the show and tell yesterday. Yeah, it does look like, no, it looks like they were printed on glass. It's got a nice uh, smooth finish, nice polish there. Um, the other thing, let me do a camera switch just because I can. I showed, uh, I had started working on a frame for my iPad that will actually end up being a uh, pinball table iPad sized pinball table. And the cool, critically cool thing here is that the thickness of the iPad is the same as the channel in this 20, 20 millimeter aluminum. Look at that. It just, I'll probably drop this and break it, but look at that beautiful fit. Barely even wiggles. Huh? Nice. This is a, oh, I'm gonna break it now. This is a 9.7 inch iPad Pro. So it was the previous generation. I got it right before the current generation came out, which is the 10 point something inch one. Don't know if they changed the thickness of it or not. So not every iPad would necessarily work in the 2020 aluminum T-slot, but I'm excited about that. So um, I've got geared up for that. And what that's gonna be is a remake of my iPad um, controller that I did using that plastic duo controller and then I changed the guts out for a teensy so that I could plug it in with the camera adapter lightning to USB and play the pinball arcade instead of whatever they had shipped with that thing and, and uh, so anyway if you remember that project uh, I was talking a little more and she said hey I bet you could do that on the new Gemma M0 so the Gemma M0 project is going to be based on this little beauty here and let me line that up, give you a bigger view. So it'll be based on that. And I think I'm gonna go for the alligator clips uh, that have a little regular header pin connector. And then those to our little arcade uh, button wiring. Some of it will be bridging with regular um, alligator clip wire for ground to pass it around, but the Gemma can handle three uh, inputs and that's exactly what I need is left flipper right flipper and the plunger so uh, I probably won't make a plunger I want to make this uh, project that, that is a very approachable one with zero soldering maybe some crimping maybe not even some crimping 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 and uh, regular buttons so that uh, anyone can make it and of course they can make it in a cardboard box or no enclosure or whatever but my idea is going to be to make it with the t-slot aluminum so That'll be an upcoming thing. Uh, and now, maker lottery when things fit without planning. Yeah, 
Uh, I think I've mentioned this before to you, Noe, maybe. Ha has anyone ever seen that website? I think it's called Things Fitting Into Things. Look that up. It's probably a Tumblr, and it's just so satisfying. It's, oh my gosh, this little hole in this thing happens to be exactly Oreo-sized, or here's three things. A battery fits into that, and then that fits into that. Anyway, it's uh, very satisfying when things happen, uh, happen to work out that way. Um, Someone says uh, crowd supply. Someone found it. Okay, if, if you're, I think Adafruit, uh, whoever's manning Adafruit on the YouTube, um, probably can throw that into the uh, Discord as well. But uh, crowd supply. I forget what I called it, but crowd supply. So moving on to what I'd like to build today. Uh, I showed these last time. These are some little 3D printed mounts that I built for the linear actuator that I'm working on uh, actuating something with for a project. So uh, let me pull this out actually and show you how that works and what the, what the point is. Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, let me get, I have a tight fit on those screws, so I'm going to go grab a T-handled Speaking of things fitting into things, there's nothing more satisfying than needing a uh, hex key and having a good one, like a T-slot. I don't have a huge collection of those, but sometimes it's exactly the one you need, and that's, that's very satisfying. So I've screwed these down into this little plywood box, and I'll leave that alone, but I will extract the actuator from the uh, the bracket. So this is kind of a bracket, it's called a clevis, C-L-E-V-I-S, and uh, usually you have a matching part called a clevis pin, which is what this axle ends up being. It's a smooth pin, uh, often with then a cotter pin, a hole in a cotter pin on the side to retain it. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do that, but the uh, clevis and clevis pin are what actuators rotate around. Um, so I'll take this side out too. Let me rotate things so that you can see them in the other camera here. Oh, I t <laughs> look at that. Yeah, I just foam stick taped that one there for uh, expediency while testing this out. So uh, you can see that in the overhead cam, you can see that what we have here is a cylinder that's on a threaded rod, and when the gear motor turns, it turns the uh, threaded rod, which in turn pushes this out because there's like a captive nut on there. Um, this piece of hardware, something pretty much like this, is what's necessary to connect it to anything. Um, and it needs to have a pivot because when it um, rotates, uh, or rather when it travels linearly, it often is going to need some play for rotation if it's like a lid that we're opening, which is what I'm going to be doing. Um, so let me turn on an old, no, oh, it's on already, great, a 12 volt power supply. Uh, one thing I found, I was actually headed to the hardware store looking for some things that this might fit in, and I just brought my linear actuator and a 9 volt battery and it won't last long doing that, but you can, in this case, it's a 12 volt um, linear actuator. I was able to actuate it at the hardware store just with a nine volt in order to check the, the full travel. So these, um, if you watch that, what am I doing? That's on, oh, let me just go in here. Okay, so you see that traveling out and let me travel it back in here for a second. So you can imagine if a lid is going, it's going to need to rotate this. And it needs to be stuck to something down here. So that's uh, what I need to build. You can buy these, of course, but if you have a very specific need or you don't feel like buying one and you want to model and 3D print it, you can do that. So that's what we'll do today. Um, hey, Mark, pay sheet. What are you talking about there? Oh, someone, Stuff with Kirby said something. PEI sheet? Don't know what that is. Um, so, first thing to do is to take some measurements. So, I'm going to get out a set of 
calipers, and I think I'm going to do this at the computer. So I mentioned to Noah and Pedro that I wish I'd done this project in, because uh, this is the second time I'm modeling this, I'm remodeling. I wish I'd done it in Fusion 360, which I don't know that well. Um, but I wish I'd done it because it's parametric and that allows you to go back and change things uh, in history. It's a, a series of steps that are essentially live calculated and you're always seeing the end result and you can slide through it. So that's the power of a parametric modeler like SolidWorks or, uh, or Fusion 360. I built it in Rhino, which is a NURBS modeler and it's just something I've used for around 20 years and I'm, and I'm very comfortable with it. Uh, but it doesn't uh, allow for that type of parametric workflow without some plugins like Grasshopper. So. Uh, I guess the good part about that is that I get to remodel it for you to see. So um, let's head over to the computer. And I've got a Rhino session there. And I'll uh, have to hold stuff up to this camera. I don't have another down shooter over here. So if you can see what I'm going to do, um, I'll actually... Okay, I work like this. So I've got... In my Rhino session, I'm just going to sketch out um, some of these dimensions so rather than write them down. So uh, first thing I care about is, let me work in millimeters. Okay, so first thing I care about, uh, let's do, yeah, how about uh, this bottom part? So I need a width of about 18 give myself a little slop for the 3D print. So let's say 18 and a quarter millimeters here uh, is what I'm gonna have to clear side to side. So uh, there's a million ways to do this, this sort of work. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of make up a workflow on the spot here as I go. So um, I'll just create an 18.25 millimeter um, line as a, let's see, is my keyboard working yet? Yeah, 18.25. Okay, so I'm just sketching in, there's a dimension that I know I'm gonna need the width of. And if this is for someone else, you can mark it up with dimension lines and things like that, I won't, I won't do that, but uh, just so you can see, you can uh, add the linear dimension here, here, and you can kind of keep track of, of things. Actually, I'll, I'll leave that one in because it looks official and snazzy. Um, the next thing I want to do is um, figure out the base, the size of the base of this. Um, it, this is kind of arbitrary, it just needs to be larger than um, the size of what we're trying to get around and we want it to be a reasonable size to mount on things. So uh, that one you can kind of make up. So I'm just going to go a little wider than uh, this. So let's say that looks like about 60 millimeters. So 60 by, let's say, 40, say 30. Should be about good. Okay, so from a top view, I'm going to make a 60 by, what did I say? 30. So I'll go 60, enter 30. So I'm just typing in dimensions in millimeters here. Uh, these don't line up with anything in particular yet, so these are just kind of for my own um, reference notes. Then the height, so I need to be able to clear the height of that uh, as we travel. And I'm also going to need to be able to, one reason you see these as a triangle often is that we don't want to run into um, the base of the actuator. So I know that this is about 18 um, millimeters there, and I want to give myself probably an extra, say, 10 on top of that. So let's do a um, 28 millimeter height, so I can go over to a side view here, and um, I'm just going to draw a line as a reference point there. Well, one thing you'll see, I don't know if you can see it on the live stream or not, is that there are a lot of, in, in these types of CAD programs, there's a lot of little helpers, um, sometimes called inferences or, or little um, rulers and guides. So as I hover on things, it tells me useful things like you have snapped to or hovered over the midpoint of a segment. You've hovered over the center of a circle and things like that. So you'll see here I'm, I'm hitting the end, one of the end lines, and, and it helpfully shows that in multiple views. So I'm in a, a side view 
and now I see that white dot and that tells me that I've got a corner, so that's good. So I'm gonna go up, um, say 28 millimeters, and just make this big while I do it. And that's my height. Okay, so that just gives me a rough idea of the volume of this thing as well as the width. So now if I want to sort of true things up a little bit, I can snap this side to side to be at the center point of that. So this, this rectangle at the bottom is becoming my kind of ground truth. Um, so I'm just gonna use the move tool and say I'm moving this object from its midpoint and then in this view if I'm sliding side to side and holding the shift key that means I'm locking it down uh, on a certain plane so it's only moving in this plane um, and if I touch the midpoint, hopefully you can see all this, the midpoint of that line, it will um, snap it to that. So again, there's a lot of mechanics of Rhino in particular, but uh, most software that you use will have um, methods of doing this sort of thing. Okay, so let's um, go ahead and I think if I want to use, how about we'll start with this base. So if I want to use this rectangle as the base, um, a couple things I'll do is just fillet the corners, which is uh, rounding them off a little bit. And I'm going to pick that and, um, again, since this isn't really a Rhino tutorial, I'll go a little faster by typing in commands. It's one of the things I like about Rhino is I can just start typing the word fillet and you can see up in the corner here uh, that things that start with those letters get a little wild carded and filled in. So fillet or fillet corners, oh yeah, I want fillet corners, so I'll hit that. Uh, it's asking for a radius, so um, right now I'm fighting all of my snapping because I, I, I'm trying to just draw a little line here, which I, I don't need a precise number, I just want to kind of eyeball that um, fillet, but it wants to snap to the center, so I'll just go and disable all my snapping for a second and I can just draw a little, uh, how about from there to there. So now I got all corners on this rectangle filleted nicely. And uh, now I'm going to raise this, uh, this curve up as a, uh, a little bit of thickness, let's say about five millimeters or so, um, as a surface. So again, there's a lot of ways of working. Some people will lay out a lot of curves and, then, and surface them at the end, which uh, works great. It's very organized, could be a smart way to do it. Um, uh, what I'll do is, uh, I won't do that, I'll, I'll sort of build pieces as I go because that's fun too. So I'm going to type in a extrude curve command and it, based on the uh, direction the, the cursor's moving, it thinks I'm either trying to go up or down and yeah, I, I want to go up but rather than click on something, I'm just going to type in five and it's going to extrude that five millimeters. So it knows the units that I'm working in, I don't have to specify. Um, I don't need that curve down there anymore. I can extract it off the surface if I do. So uh, just to kind of keep my scene neat here, I'll blow it away. Uh, and then I will uh, cap this thing. So that just puts a surface, um, fills in the holes of the surface basically. And that looks nice. Let's go ahead and throw in some screw holes. So um, I don't feel like going and measuring the screws I'm using. So I'm gonna cheat here and just measure um, the ones I did on the last one. So I, I won't lie to you, it's a little baking show-ish for me to do, but. Uh, so I'm using M3 screws. So this is 3.3-ish uh, for the, the hole, and it's got like a little recess that goes out to about six. So um, to do this, let's see, a fun way to do it. How about I'll make some cylinders. So I'm gonna create a solid and I kind of put it anywhere I want and then move it into place or build it right where I think I'm gonna want it. Um, if I turn snapping back on, um, I can create a inference to my radius. So now I have a point that is where the radius starts. This might not be where I want it, but it's actually kind of a, um, a good reference point to then build other stuff off of. Um, so here, I'll just build it here and then move it. You'll see what I, I'm talking about. Again, it's a bit sloppy, but it's just a, a way to work. So what did I say this was? A 3.3 is the diameter. And then the um, height doesn't matter because I'm just gonna use this to cut out or Boolean out a hole. So uh, I just need to 
drag it so it goes completely through the surface. Um, and now I'm going to move it in, let's say, uh, one cylinder unit to the right and one down. So uh, again, I'm just going to pick the move tool and I'm going to snap to this edge and then snap to the edge of his ghost, which is kind of cool. You can, while you're moving things, uh, reference where things were. And then I'll do that again, hitting return re uh, repeats that command and now travel south. And I kind of like that placement. So now to duplicate this thing before I go and cut it out, I'm going to mirror it across the X axis and then across the Y axis. So I'm typing mirror, I'm hitting the midpoint and I'm doing a duplicate that is uh, symmetrical across the surface of the object. Um, so yeah, let's just go ahead and cut these out. So I'll do a uh, Boolean difference. And then it's asking me, select the surfaces you want to subtract with. I already had one thing picked, so that's what's being subtracted from. And now I can pick the stuff that I want to yank out of there, hit enter, and it deleted them. It kept my cylinders around because I left an option on that doesn't delete the sort of carving object, so I left it there. Um, but I don't need them. So I will, uh, yeah, I'll delete them. Actually, here, I'll show you something that's useful. I'm going to put them on a little layer. So I'm making a new layer, and I can hide them away there, and I can just call them uh, screw holes hit the uh, light bulb for off, and then I'll pick them and switch their layer assignment to screw holes, and then they'll disappear for me. Okay, so that's my base, and guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna save my file, because I haven't yet, and that's always terrifying. Uh, does this go yet? Yeah, it does, okay. So I'm gonna just call you Clevis02, and... Oh, you know what? I don't have my YouTube chat up. I'm just seeing the live broadcast one in Discord, so... Let me travel over there and see, because I like being up on what's going on. Let's see. Live chat. Uh, Mark asks, do I recommend Rhino over Fusion? I recommend Fusion over Rhino, even though I, I fall back to Rhino a lot because I know it well and have used it for years. Rhino costs a decent bit of money, and Fusion is free, I think, or sometimes you have to buy a piece of equipment that gives you a free license or whatever. But more importantly, um, Rhino is a very specific workflow that's good for certain types of surface design and industrial design and, and, and or organic things, but is not parametric. So when you model things in it, the if I want to change those screw holes in an hour or even in 10 minutes to be bigger, uh, there is not a history um, of connected operations. It's not, it doesn't have a node-based workflow uh, where you can go earlier in the graph and say, oh, let's change that diameter I typed into those cylinders to eight, and all of a sudden our holes are bigger even though we've done lots of stuff. And that's super, super uh, helpful if you're building stuff for 3D printing. Less so if you're making conceptual things or sculptures, um, but the, yeah, so Short, short version is I would recommend uh, people learn Fusion. It seems like a really great CAD program for most of this kind of work these days. Um, but at least here you'll get to see maybe a slightly older fashioned workflow. Um, okay, so I've made these holes and you know, I'll, I'll put in those little fillets as well. So um, what I can do is I'm gonna create um, circles again that are right here that are the size of the holes I cut out. And I could have duplicated those edges or just do this. Um, and then I'm going to duplicate one of those. Actually, I'm just going to make a circle that has a uh, six millimeter opening. So I'll go to the center of this and then come out here and say, uh, oh, uh, let me do a center diameter circle. Circle diameter. I'll have to move it. Okay. Um, so from here, I'm just making it kind of anywhere, six millimeters done, and now I'll move it just based on its center point to the center point of this other circle. All I'm doing here is kind of eyeballing a little chamfer that I can cut out. Um, or is that the best way to do it? Actually, let me show you just with a chamfer command, but that's probably smart. So maybe ignore what I just did. Chamfer edge and uh, this one, right now it's going to make a one millimeter chamfer. Let's see, is that right? 
No, I need to go three because I want to come out from three to six. Okay. So u and distance is a three. Done. Done. Okay. And now I can uh, hit return. And every time I hit, whoa, it increased the size of that one like crazy. What was that? Cancel that. What happened? That was weird. Did I do it twice? U, U, chamfer. Oh, is it one and then three? Yeah. One, three. Oops. Oh, I think I, I had a weird option. Oh, well, that went right. You know, I don't want to sort through what I'm doing wrong in there, so I am going to back out for a second, sorry, and uh, turn this into a surface to carve out of there. That I should... Don't follow what I'm doing here. This is ridiculous that I didn't do that right. But uh, Well, you know what? Let me try it once more now that the setting's in there from, from the beginning of this guy. Let's see. That's, uh, that's kind of huge. So let's do U. Let's go back to that one. U. Whoa. U. OK. Yeah, I guess I had a different setting from my first to my second. And I don't know that I have that exactly right, but I'm just using some little wood screws, so that should be fine. Uh, okay, last thing I was going to do is put a big M6 uh, hole in the middle so that if I need to screw it down into the end, or actually a 5, um, into the end of something like that uh, T-slot aluminum. Let me show you this for a second. If you look at, um, I think you can see that. Switch my camera for a second. Oh. Oh, haha. Got to be in this program to use the switcher. There we go. Uh, so yeah, if you look at the uh, end of this, it uses a 5, I believe it's a M5 screw. You have to thread it, you have to tap it. But uh, So if I wanted to mount something on the end, it'd be kind of nice to have the screw already there in this mount. Um, could be a little funky because it could twist, but um, let's see. Let's switch to this view. Sorry about that. Okay. So let's put a 5 millimeter hole through there. Um, let's see, is there a fun different way I can show you to do this? Uh, nah, let's just make another cylinder. So, cylinder, uh, he can be aligned by me hovering over and now it's got the center point because uh, I marked two, two midpoints. And now uh, diameter five, boom, and then the height just needs to be tall enough to carve through. Um, I can maybe shade this. It would be easier for you to see while I'm doing some of this stuff. So now, uh, again, do a Boolean difference. And yoink, gone. And I'll put this onto my screw holes layer so that I have him if I need him later. And now I can, if I right click, I can see all the commands or the last 10. So I'm going to go back to this chamfer edge and give him the treatment there too. Okay, how are we doing on time? It's two, so we got a half hour or a little less. Um, I want to look at, there's the YouTube chat, all right. Um, someone asked us about SolidWorks. That's a great program. It's a sort of an industry standard in a lot of fields. Uh, when I was at Disney, it was pretty much the standard within Imagineering. Um, it's just very expensive. Um, yeah, oh, Mark mentions he's building his ball clock replica. Mark's doing cool stuff with uh, clocks lately. So I think you were using Tinkercad for the hands on that one clock you were doing, Mark. Um, I, I would recommend Fusion. And by the way, here's a tip for people in, uh, at least in some cities in the US, if you have a library card, you can get a uh, free login for lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. I'm not affiliated with them anyway. Uh, but they, those are great tutorials for all sorts of graphic applications, and it's usually quite expensive. They have a really nice series of Fusion tutorials, and uh, you don't have to pay anything for it if you have a library card and your library supports this little reciprocal thing they have with them. Super cool. Uh, I'm in LA. The LA Public Library has this feature. So Mark, you should definitely check it out. Um, and beyond that, 
The Ruiz brothers, Noe and Pedro of Adafruit, have a bunch of great tutorials on Fusion 360 and how they build everything they build. They've got tutorials on and model files, so um, it's an amazing resource. Check it out. Noe started with Tinkercad. There you go. Um, okay, uh, next thing. Let's build up the um, sides. So here's what I'm thinking. This, this is the, let me go to the right side of the model. This is the top of the model here. Let me, let me draw a line out. Um, so that's the peak of it. This is the edge it's coming off of. And I'm, to get to this height, I'm just going to make a triangle. It's just eyeballed. It doesn't really have to um, be any particular triangle. And I'll do, say, that. Mirror this. Okay, if you look from another view, you can see now I have these. I don't need you anymore. Um, I can, whoops, I need to get out of that tool. I'm going to do a little polyline from here to here. Let me put my model on its own layer so I can hide that. Uh, how about that? That would be good. So let's just do model base. And I'll set them over here. Just hide them for a second. Um, I don't need you circles. Goodbye. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to connect the dots and build this triangle, and then I can extrude it out, position it, and join it up with the rest of the model, and then I'll carve some um, screw holes out of it, or uh, bolt holes, or what would be the clevis pin holes. So now I'm going to join these curves. I'm just going to pick all of those. Oh, nice of the dimension line to join us. Hello. Uh, join. So that's a single closed curve now. And uh, let's fill it just these corners up at the top. So if I do fill it, I will pick that and that, and that and that. Oops, try again. Oh, this fill's too big. It won't reach across. So let me undo uh, and get a little less sloppy about that. OK, so fill it. And the radius, I'm going to, oh, I can't draw it in that mode. OK, sorry. I'll have to type in a number. So this is about one, oh, about a one millimeter. Let's try, uh, we can go a bigger, about two, wonk, wonk. And then another one here, wonk, wonk. OK, it's kind of nice, a little rounded thing. We could put a circle in there that's tangent and drive into it, but I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Uh, and now, remember, we, the first thing we did was the, uh, oh, that's funny. So what will happen sometimes if you're drawing from a um, construction plane that's orthographic is you'll build things that are correct from one view but wonky from another view. Um, and a nice feature here in Rhino is that I can flatten that by slamming it up against the construction plane of one view. So over here in this ZY right view, that's correct. It's just weird in world, um, world space, but in this 2D space, it's fine. So um, I'm just going to do a project to C plane, the construction plane, and I'll delete the input. So you can see it, it flattened it out against the world. It's now a 2D curve again, which is what I need. Um, let me save. And the... Uh, if someone asked, is SolidWorks easier than Fusion or not? I think Fusion is easier. It's, uh, SolidWorks is 25 years old, and so it's built on a lot of uh, cruft and old ways of doing things. I mean, it's massively powerful. It's, it's a different scale of tool for sure, but Fusion is, I, I think, much easier to get into. And I'm not a SolidWorks guy, but I've dabbled in it enough to know that uh, it's beastly. Okay, so now in uh, this view here. Let me turn on the model file so it makes a little more sense. This was the edge of the center of the tube. So um, just sketching this in here for a second. Whoop. Come over here. Let me go to a front view. Uh, something like that is the gap within which the tube is going to fit. And sometimes what I'll do, I didn't have a lot of time here, sometimes what I'll do is model a rough version of the thing that's not what I'm printing, but just to make sure that I have some sanity. So we might do that if we have time. Um, but for now, that's the little swing set of space that I need to leave. 
Um, so if I come into this view, I will um, I can snap to that. So if I use the move tool, I'll say, okay, I'm going to snap uh, from anything on this this line. So the end, let's say, I'm holding shift, so I'm only going sideways, and then I'm going to inference that point that I had made before. Um, so now it's exact, and I can delete. The first one, I'll build this whole model and then replicate it across the mirror plane. So this one now, I'm going to do the same sort of extrusion, um, extrude curve, and I think make this about uh, six millimeters thick. I like it. I will cap it. Now it can be, uh, if, I've, if I haven't screwed anything up, it should be uh, able to meld with the base perfectly because it sits at the same point. I, I built the curves off of each other so the, the alignment ought to be perfect or within whatever the tolerance of um, floating point decimals that Rhino works at, which I think for NURB, uh, these are degree three NURB curves, uh, it might be like seven or nine points of precision. It's, it's really a precise NURBS engine. Uh, okay, so let's put a hole in it. Um, what I want is, okay, looking at, looking at this guy from before, I want clearance, so I, I want the hole to be pretty close to the top. Um, I can get out my calipers and see that a, let me use this side of it, about three millimeters should be good. So let's do that. Um, and this is, I'm going to measure this hole because, and my bolts because that's what's going through the thing. So let me grab one of you guys. Where'd you go? Here you are. Okay, so um, here you see. That's what it's going to be rotating around. Um, I think that's a five millimeter. Nope, that's a 5.8. Oh, this must be an M6. Okay. Not an M5. And M5 was the aluminum end. Okay. So yeah, my hole is five, eight, six. That just fits, doesn't it? Oh no. Caliper reading. If I get it right, it is six. Okay. So let's make this hole a little bit bigger than six. It doesn't have to be perfect uh, fit since the 3D print will probably have a little sort of negative kerf into there. I'm sure there's a better word for that, right, guys? Um, so, um, I, yeah, I'd like a little, little, I don't want any friction with this thing if it's turning sometimes. So, uh, what did I say? Say a 6.1 should be enough. So, I'll go to this view here, and let me shade that for you. I'll hit save, because I'm a super paranoid guy when it comes to saving. And uh, again, I can just make a cylinder and carve it out. So uh, I want to make a, yeah, that'll ask for the diameter. Get caught up with diameter versus radius. Some tools ask for one, some ask for the other. Uh, you're asking for diameter. Yay, good. So six, oh, I said 6.1, right? Six point one. Okay, and then it wants to know the height of it, which just needs to be thick enough to carve a decent hole out of there. Uh, and then I said three millimeters down from the top, um, so it's at the top. What is it? No, I was just eyeballing stuff. I'm a liar. Okay, um, for this I can just move it three millimeters down. Oops, not like that. I can't. So if I click this move tool, it, it asks for a dimension. So I'll do negative three. Okay. So that's where I want the hole. I'll go ahead and carve it out. Um, so Boolean two objects also works. And this is kind of a neat one because it lets you click through the different possible Booleans. Here, let me make this big. This is just fun. So here's a um, keep the cylinder, keep the outsides of the cylinder, keep the part. That's what we want. Uh, join them together, go back through. Okay. And before I duplicate this one, I'll put a little bit of a bevel on this, uh, a little, a little uh, fillet. 
and a radius of how about point three. Oh, I didn't say fillet edge. It's looking for a curve. Sorry. Uh, fillet. Some operations work on curves. Some operate on edges of surfaces. So this is that one. Uh, so my edge to fillet, I want, what did I say, point 0.1. How about point 0.2. Nice. Let's do one over here. Lovely. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. I mean, we could get fancy and round some other stuff. Actually, here's, let's look at the way this operates. Uh, currently, with this previous design I did, I bang into this. If I were being good right now and I don't have the time, I would model that and, and check the clearances or do some, some calculations. Um, I think for this, if we want to, yeah, I'm going to leave it alone, but you could make a, a swoopier design or give some negative space or a straight edge. There's a lot of designs on these to depending on what you're doing, but for a generalized one this should be a good design. Uh, and the other thing I might do is just fill at these edges as well. Uh, if it's going to make me pick all of them, all right. That looks nice. I'm sure there's a command I'm forgetting to do that well, but that worked well enough. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, mirror this across to the other side. And again, I have points that I know are at the center, so I can select them. Oh, didn't like that. What did I type? Mirror. And boop, boop. Now I've got two sides of it, and I'm going to save. I will duplicate this before I join them, just because I might want to make bigger hold versions of these or who knows what I want to change. It's kind of nice to keep a, a copy. Um, so I will copy in place. And that's now got a second set there. And I'll just make a new layer to put that on. Uh, let go. Hopefully not everyone is on that one. Nope. OK. Good. I still have a set. And let me just call this duplicate. I don't know what these are called. Are these arms? I've just decided they're called the arms. OK, and now I can Boolean join uh, these. So Boolean union, sorry. And now that's one object. Get rid of this dimension line. I don't actually need it anymore. Get rid of that one. Um, why don't we try to 3D print this? Just, there's plenty of refinements we can do, but um, Oh, my 3D printer's not plugged in. All right, and can I get a camera over here? How about I will, if you bear with me a second, try to swing this camera around. Come here, little camera. Oh, you know what? Maybe I have an easier camera to do. That one? No, that one's going to be a pain. Okay. I have not set up the, here we're going to 3D print. OK, that should work. So let's, um, oh, but before I do that, let me, let me go ahead and send this over to uh, prepare for printing. So out of here, I'm going to export an STL file. Export selected. And sure, it goes there, Clevis 02. So stereolithography, that's what STL is. It's an old, old file format from when people first started intersecting lasers to harden goo. I think that's where the stereo comes from, and the lithography is the, it's an image basically painted on the goo. And that looks good. Export, I uh, will use, I'm going to use the type A. Uh, printer, uh, what do they call it, Series 1 Type A machines, Series 1 Pro, and I need power. And, oh, I have an outlet. All right. I'm threatening to get like a head-mounted camera so you can see all that kind of fun stuff. And, oh, so let's open, I'm going to um, tell 
my software to show, bear with me, the right screen. Configure screen to be Cura type A. Okay. All right. So you should have gotten a new window to look at there. And this is going to be really simple. All I'm going to do is load in that STL file. There it is. It looks beautiful. Um, and these settings, I'm going to go up to 80. Don't cringe, Ruiz Brothers, because I barely know what I'm doing when it comes to print settings compared to these guys. All right. I like to just look at it and see that doesn't look super dense. So how about a infill distance of three? Every three millimeters should have. That looks good. How long is that going to take to print? 48 minutes. You will not get to see this finish, but that's all right. We'll at least start it. Uh, because I think we're going to end in six minutes. So there's no version of this I could do fast enough. But sorry. We'll at least get it started, and I'll post up some pictures later. So I'm going to send that to the printer. And whip this around like so. I'll switch my camera view to not yet. This. Yes, this. All right. There we go. Um, we're going to print in black because that's what's loaded. Did I do a send to printer? Where is? I don't think I did. Open interface. So my, for whatever reason, this printer uh, opens up Firefox as the interface, and I've left it that way because I use Chrome for so many other things. Why not? love over their way. And okay, good. It has shown up. Uh, I'll just hit print rather than show you that interface. Okay, so that's going to get started. And that is that. So do you guys have any other questions while we spend a few minutes watching that get started? We can just answer some questions in the chat. Uh, how do you print the side holes without them becoming squashed oblongs? Ooh, that's a really good question. So let me go back. Um, let me go back to about the 3D printer uh, interface. So the short answer is sometimes it just works out. Uh, there's just enough overhang from the previous layer that it has something to sit on and it doesn't squish down. And uh, that's basically the settings I used on this previous one. Let me, uh, let me unscrew that, that one there and you can see. Hold on one second. Otherwise, Mark, um, you can print it with um, support material internally. So usually there's options for printing with support material only where something hovers over the build plate if you have an overhang. But you can also do internal ones and then just chip out the, the filament later. It doesn't have a very strong connection. The software, I think, alters um, temperature settings maybe, cooling settings, probably fan settings, um, and just barely kisses the surface of the... Uh, part of the model you want to keep. So, I mean, I mean, you know this, you've got three printer, you've done this, but the, the support material is made to um, chip off of there. So here is the one I've made before. Um, and those are pretty circular circles. Now that you say it, there's probably, I don't know, slight oblongness? No, it really does. Hey, let's get out some calipers and see. How well did the printer do with me doing very little settings wise? Okay, so I get, 5.67 and 5. Point yeah, so it might be a tenth of a millimeter off. It's hard to know because you can kind of flex this plastic a bit. 5.63, five, 5.7, five, yeah, like a, a tenth to a twentieth off, something like that. Or is that a tenth to a fifth of a millimeter off? Um, 
But if no one Pedro in the chat, they know a ton. Uh, next broadcast, I will definitely show the end result of that. Yeah. And um, while that print gets going, I can zoom in there for a second. Let's see if I don't break the world doing that. Is this on manual focus? No, it just doesn't want to focus. Hey, over here. All right, well, I'm going to switch that back to the workshop view. I'm sorry, guys, I'm moving a camera around on you, but let's, uh, let's look professional here <laughs> as we finish up. Head over to the wire cast. Ooh, that's a nice view of a mess. How about, and there. So, yeah, next time, you know what I'll probably do, and let me raise my camera up, is uh, I'll have the finished results of those, and uh, if I need to make any changes or improvements, I will show you what those were and why I did them. Um, and the point of it is going to be to open up a chest. This is part of a mystery box series, so I have a two part, or it's two halves of this project. The first is this chess board, um, which I teased. I don't think I've shown much of this yet, so let me see if I can switch to the overhead. Um, so I'm going to have the RFID reader under the chess board along with a radio feather, uh, one of the 900 megahertz feathers, and then I've got these teeny tiny little NFC chips which are very easy to embed underneath the felt sticker on a chess piece. Um, and let me take this stuff out. As you can imagine, there's a lot of chess boards that fold up or have drawers. There's enough space to fit all that and the batteries and so on in there. Um, and so the puzzle will involve figuring out where to find some pieces is like an escape room thing. So you'll have to get some pieces and probably solve some sort of puzzle that leads you to a coordinate system. So, oh, E4 and D4, rook and pawn. And so this reader is actually capable of reading two tags simultaneously. Um, so with just one reader, I can read a combination of them. Otherwise, if it were a single piece, some, someone could kind of brute force it and just try every piece. But this will, of a bunch of possible pieces, someone will have to get the right two spaces and they'll have to get the right two pieces. Um, and I could also potentially do um, which piece goes down first. So the clashing detection isn't perfect, but it could probably detect that, oh, where am I there on the camera? Uh, it could probably detect that, hey, we have no piece, oh, we have the paw and that's good. And then what next piece shows up that's unique is the rook. That will then send the signal across the room to the linear actuator to lift open the trunk. So that's the goal. That's why we're building this. And I'll show you uh, live as I build it. And then uh, I'll work on a guide afterwards. So um, let's switch back over to this camera. And I'll just see uh, any last questions in the chat. Um, ooh, this chat's catching up. Going in and out. Oh, Noe. Noe's got a four-year-old who's uh, asking for his attention. Let's see. Always ream out your holes. Yeah, Robbie. Yeah, sometimes you just get, get a little uh, reamer. I've got one right here that I use um, a lot. I put some a big blob of Sugru on there to have a nice grip on it. I forget what I was reaming that had such aggressive needs that the, the regular handle wasn't comfortable enough. Uh, but these are fantastic. Uh, you've seen me often use that little Yankee screwdriver that has a, a real um, reamer bit. Um, same thing, having sideways blades is so much better than the spiral of a drill. And with this, you can get, uh, you know, go in, twist, check your hole. Is it big enough? Just go in a little further, twist. So I recommend these. I don't know when I got this or how much it cost, but I think it's pretty inexpensive to get a decent enough uh, reamer. That's a great way to widen out these these holes here just go in and carve it up okay um well thank you all so much and for people who are on youtube in the chat if you want to go check out discord uh maybe scott or someone 
has put it. Yes, Scott, who is our czar of Discord, among other things, has put a link in the YouTube for the Discord chat. So people will be able to continue hanging out there. YouTube shuts the chat down when the live stream ends. So head out there if you want to talk some more. And I will see you next week. Bye, everybody.